Welcome to Logos Live. My name is Andrew Laird and I'm from the City Bible Forum here in Melbourne. Filling in today for your usual host, uh, Robert Martin. Uh, Rob is away on holidays this week having a well-earned break. Now, Logos is Greek for word or message. And Logos Live engages the Christian message before a live audience in the CBD of Melbourne. And do we have a live audience here today? Yay! Very good. <laughs> We also aim to have a little bit of fun. Who said exploring the big questions of life shouldn't be enjoyable? Well, what are we to make of work? Challenging, enjoyable, stretching, fulfilling, or necessary, painful, difficult, frustrating? Uh, In this series of Logos Live, Frustration to Fulfillment, we're asking, is it possible to find something more at work? And today we want to consider an issue related to work that perhaps needs little explanation for all of us, frustration. I am frustrated at work. And to help us, we have Cara Martin join us. Cara is the Associate Dean of the Ridley Marketplace Institute. She has a background in media and communications, as well as having worked in human resources, business analysis and policy development roles in a variety of different organisations. And she is also married and has two adult children. So would you please welcome Cara Martin. (laughs) Thank you. Cara, I'm tempted to begin by asking which of those different roles that you have had was the most frustrating, uh, but I don't want to single out one profession. So perhaps what was the first job you ever got paid for and what were some of the frustrations there? Sure. Well, uh, my first job was as a waitress. I think um, most women have experience either as a shop assistant or a waitress as one of their first roles. Um, As a waitress, I was absolutely appalling. Um, (laughs) I was just hopeless. In the end, they tried to keep me away from any food making or anything like that. Just serve the food, take the orders. That was it. Um, And we had a chef who was like one of those authentic chefs you hear about, the horror chefs. He would actually literally throw knives around the kitchen so I was very glad to stay away from the food preparation. (laughs) Right so your life was on the line every day. (laughs) Absolutely it was it was very scary we had to keep the chef happy. (laughs) Wow there you go (laughs) hopefully that's not the case anymore you haven't had any more knives being thrown at you. Not lately no. no. Good (laughs) well we try to have a little bit of fun on Logos Live so we're gonna have a quick quiz to begin with to test how much you know about frustration in the Australian workforce. So two questions. Okay. Here we go. You ready? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In a survey published in early 2015, what percentage of Australians said they were satisfied in their work and not considering changing jobs? So A, 50%, half the workforce is satisfied in their job, not looking to change jobs anytime soon. Or B, 33%, one third. C, 20%, so one in five say I'm satisfied in my job, I'm not looking to change. Or D, just 15%. Wow, that's scary. That's nothing over 50%. (laughs) Um, I'll go for B, 33%. 33%, so one in three people Mm. is all that says they're satisfied. Well, the correct answer is actually D. Oh, that's shocking, isn't it? <laughs> it is this shocking. This is a good topic. <laughs> <laughs> of the 18,000 wow. people, Australians who were surveyed in early 2015, 85% say they were dissatisfied in their current role wow. and looking out for other opportunities. I thought it was just me, but there's others. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps even more depressingly, that figure is up from 80% in 2012, which means we're becoming more dissatisfied with our work rather than less. All right, next question. In a follow-up survey, what was the number one reason given for why Australians leave their jobs? <laughs> okay, four options. Is it a lack of opportunities to advance in the workplace? B, unsatisfactory leadership? C, annoying colleagues? <laughs> or D, dirty dishes always being left in the kitchen sink in the office? <laughs> I think D is the most frustrating thing, but no, no. Um, I would say B, poor leadership. I want to try maybe another. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. uh, A? Very good. Correct. (laughs) Thank you for that slight hint. 
<laughs> no, the correct answer is not being given enough opportunities to advance mm. in the workplace. Fair enough. Although, mm. if you've been in any workplace for a period of time, probably D as well. The, the dishes <laughs> in the kitchen sink causes pr- plenty of uh, fights in the office. Absolutely. So, Cara, in our uh, frustration at work quiz, you got one out of two right. I think so. half. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. How about a round of applause for Cara? <laughs> As I said, in that, in that survey, the number one reason mm. that uh, Australians are leaving their workplaces at the moment is a lack of advancement opportunities, being mm. a big frustration. 22% mm. said that, so one in five. But it was followed closely behind by the 19% who said unsatisfactory leadership, which I think is code for I don't like my boss. <laughs> Um, In fact, one person who was uh, reflecting on this survey summarised the results like this. He said, people never leave companies, they only ever leave managers. Mm. So is our problem with work just simply the boss? Uh, (laughs) I would say no. I think it's very easy to blame the boss. I think uh, the boss can actually become the focal point. And certainly you can get lots of support from your co-workers by blaming the boss. Everyone's very happy to do that. Basically, we want to blame someone else or something else for the frustration, for the fact that we're not being recognised as we think we should, etc. Um, so I think it's easy to do that. It's not the only thing that's the problem with the workplace. On the other hand, I do think leadership has a, a major role. So resentment can build up if you don't feel you're getting clear direction, if you feel that the boss is changing their mind all the time, you feel there's been poor communication, all those things can multiply your frustration hugely. Mm. You did say there's probably other factors as well at play. What are some of the other frustrations that perhaps you have heard is that people experience with their work? Sure. Well, um, we've done some surveys recently and the number one challenge people feel about the workplace is stress. They feel Mm. under incredible stress and that stress is from uh, work deadlines, their jobs are too demanding, people expect too much of them and it's linked to the number two one which is conflict in the workplace. Mm. Arguments, miscommunication, problems, um, just falling out with people. And the third one is Uh, in the area of ethical decisions. There's a lot of people who feel that they're being made to work or behave in ways that they don't feel entirely comfortable with. So those are the sorts of frustrating things I'm hearing. So a lot of those, I guess, are are outside of ourselves, people we work with, demands that are placed on us, that sort of thing. And you mentioned a moment ago the idea of, I guess, looking for people to blame (laughs) for frustration at work. And a lot of those are probably true. But is there perhaps a sense also in which some of the frustration might be with ourselves? Mm. It's the last place we would tend to look, I think, Uh, (laughs) because because it is much easier to see faults in others. But just as we see that someone else is not communicating well, not working exactly the way we want them to, um, someone else is you know, clearly not operating in the values of the organisation, that person could very easily be us in someone else's eyes. So I think, yes, I think think one of the things that we need to occasionally do is stop and say, okay, you know, how am I actually contributing to some of the things? How am I getting someone else frustrated at work? Mm. Mm. And perhaps is there a sense ever of feeling that um, we might hope to do certain things in our work life, dreams that we might have, and just even our personal limitations might might frustrate us as well? Absolutely. I mean, you said the number one thing was lack of opportunity and, and advancement. We always have a much bigger idea of what we're capable of and what we could do than actually what reality turns out. And uh, And in our work, we're conscious that the work output is never quite what we hope it would be. We're never given exactly the resources we would love, the support we would want, the colleagues we'd like to work with. So there's always limitations like that. So what are some of the ways that you think we might try and um, deal with these different frustrations? Mm, I think there are three ways that people deal with them. The first one is self-medication. Um, for me, that's chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Packet of Tim Tams, easy after a bad day. But it can also be alcohol, obviously, mm. is a really popular one. And certainly I mean, even in the CBD, you see at five o'clock, you see a lot of frustrated people just beginning to forget about their work. So that's how <laughs> at we're the dealing bar. with our frustration <laughs> yeah, that's at the right. bar at five o'clock. <laughs> that's yep. right. Um, and it, I mean, obviously, other illicit drugs are on the rise as well. Um, 
The second way, I think, is changing jobs. Uh, and we just saw that in terms of the number of people who want to sort of change jobs, hop over to another, a different place. Um, I think frustrations build up and a way of dealing with that is actually to get out. And the third way is escapism. I think this whole concept that Australians have of living for the weekend mm. is really big. So I'll just get through the week. So Wednesday is hump day. It's just getting over the top of the middle and then Friday, you know, we praise God it's Friday because that's the <laughs> last day of work and then here's the weekend and, you know, we're going to do this and this and this and this and escape. And the holiday thing is huge too, I think. I think Facebook has really made that much worse. I'm getting so tired of seeing everybody's overseas trips right now. <laughs> Making me so jealous. But, uh, yeah, I think this this planning the next big holiday and, you know, I can just get through work because I've got this to look forward to. So living for something else in the future yeah. that's not work. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Do those things work at all? <laughs> um, no, they don't. Because I think what happens when you're self-medicating, you're actually not resolving anything. You're just covering it up. Uh, if you're actually changing jobs, it means that you're just changing one set of frustrations for another set that's going to build up. <laughs> There'll be annoying colleagues somewhere else too. <laughs> Absolutely, there will be. And uh, escapism is just postponing the pain. Yeah, it's going to catch up eventually. But mm. I guess they might work for a moment, sure. which is like why mm. we might, I guess, look into those things, but mm. perhaps not lasting solution. No, I don't, think, um, I don't think it helps to actually deal with the things that frustrate us or our attitude to it. And certainly what it can do is stop you doing that thing you were talking about, actually looking inside for what am I contributing to this. Mm. Now, Cara, you're a Christian person. I am. <laughs> in a moment, we're going to uh, look at how you think the Christian faith mm. and words in the Bible actually help us both understand frustration at work and deal with it. Um, but before we come to that, why are you a Christian? Why, what do you find compelling about the Christian faith? Ah, well, I became a Christian when I was young, actually. I was at a camp. I come from a non-Christian family and... Um, my mum still regrets sending me on this camp <laughs> anyway. I went on this camp and there was a guy drawing cartoons and he drew this picture of uh, Jesus standing at the door, knocking. And the guy explained, you know, this is Jesus standing at the door of your heart and if you open that door, then Jesus will come inside your heart. And he said, you know, why don't you go home and pray about that? So I did pray about it and I just said simply, Jesus, I'm opening the door of my heart. And I just felt this a physical, tangible sensation that I, I can still remember now, mm. I can still feel it now, of just this warmth. And I just knew, wow, something's different. So I guess my introduction to Christianity was that heart thing. And I think still it's an, it's an explanation and a way into deeper relationship, not just with God, but with other people. Mm. And what followed after that was some of the head stuff. Like for me, Christianity and the Bible just helped to make a lot of sense of the things I see and experience around me. Mm. Mm. You say it makes sense of the world. Mm. Um, so the Bible actually does have things to say about work, a big part of our, Absolutely. our life. Absolutely. There's so much in there about work. <laughs> but um, even with the very simple thing of right at the start, we see that, that God is at work. God is working in creation. And then he makes human beings. And uh, we're made in the image of the God who works. And we see this process of unveiling through the Bible that, that work is actually really important. It's part of who we are, how we're made. It's actually as where we get a sense of meaning and purpose from. Work is a good thing. <laughs> and uh, work is a way of us expressing our gifts and skills. It's a way of provi providing for ourselves and our family. It's a way of serving other people. It's a way of serving God. Mm. Mm. So work is a good thing according to the Bible. But we're talking about frustration at work. Yep. Uh, what does the Bible say about why work might be frustrating? If we just go to the first three chapters of the Bible, we see this, this picture unveiled. So we start off in chapter one with God creating the world and creating people. And we see this beautiful image of, of things being made really well. Um, great excellence in the way things are made. Uh, things are very bountiful. Um, God looks at it and says, it's good, it's very good. And then in the second chapter, he invites human beings to be part of this work. We're invited to dig the ground in the garden and, and look after it and invited to name the animals. So this is a picture of us working with God, which is really beautiful. 
And then chapter three, <laughs> da 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 da, <laughs> everything goes horribly wrong. We have that scene of the serpent uh, tempting Eve to, to do the one thing God asked human beings not to do, which is eat the fruit of this special tree, and she eats it, and then she gives it to Adam. And then we have this series of curses of um, the, the serpent, and then of Eve, um, that not of Eve, but the fact that her labor and childbirth is the process that is going to be more painful. And then we see that the ground is cursed, and, and God warns Adam that your work is going to be a lot more difficult and uh, that actually it's going to be painful toil. There's going to be thorns and thistles. It's going to be much harder to mm. work from now on. Mm. Mm. We have that third curse in Genesis um, chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. Do you want to just, I guess, unpack a little bit for us ways in which our work is affected um, by us? And so you're saying the relationship between uh, work being frustrating now is a direct consequence of us sinning. Yeah, so I think... What happens with sin is it breaks down relationship. It breaks down our relationship with God. So we're no longer working closely with God and, and under his protection and his security. Um, it also breaks down relationship with each other. So that the problems that we have getting along with people, you can see starting right away from there. And then it also breaks down our relationship with created things so I mean all you have to do is have a computer to know that <laughs> things are not as they should there's a there's a breakdown in the, in the way basic things work um, and it's so frustrating and I think all of that is really an outcome of of the entry of this this rupture in relationships in all those different levels these this breakdown mm. of relationship with with people with the mm. things we work with but mm. ultimately it's because of a breakdown of relationship with God yeah that's right okay mm. Now, you mentioned a moment ago here in, in this passage in Genesis 3, it talks about us having to deal with thorns and thistles mm. in our work. That all sounds very agricultural. <laughs> Most of us aren't dealing with thorns and thistles in the office. So what relevance does that mm. have with our work today? I have lots of uh, metaphorical thorns and thistles. So I think going back to computers. Uh, so <laughs> the other day I was going to do an update that was going to take me half an hour. It took four hours. Like I think that was a, a thistle. Um, yeah, the marketing manager goes away, doesn't tell you when they're coming back and a product launch is delayed. Um, hoping to get 50 sales, you get 38. There's just that disappointment, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you send in your end of month report and even though you've worked really, really hard, um, the only feedback you get is that you didn't make the figures you were meant to. It's like this, this constant sort of, you know, it's not as productive as it should be. It's not as good as it should be. It's just a lot harder than it should be. The idea, I guess, fruitlessness. Yeah, that's right. Um, to use mm. the agricultural language, mm. we wanted fruit to be produced, but mm. things oftentimes... Thorns and thistles. <laughs> the thorns and thistles instead, rather than yeah. the fruit on the tree. Yeah. yeah. It says there in that passage in Genesis that this will be the case all the days of your life. I know, that's pretty depressing. <laughs> that sounds it? pretty depressing. So how is, it, yeah. how is it helpful for us to have a passage from the mm. Bible like this which says this is the reality for your work? Um, I think what it does is it helps to make sense of what we see and experience. Mm. You know, intuitively we know that things aren't as they should be, that their work is harder than it, than it should be. So to actually have something that, helps to explain that, I think actually makes things a lot easier. Uh, I think also, uh, especially with the work relationships, it helps to make sense of that. And I think it also gives us the opportunity, as I said, of stopping and maybe thinking about, okay, um, if everything is broken around me, there's just a possibility I might be a little broken too. So <laughs> how am I actually contributing to mm. some of this as well? So it's an opportunity to to hold the mirror up and look at ourselves as well. So for me, it just helps to make sense of some of the mess and maybe, you know, alter my expectations a little bit and plan for things not maybe not to go so right. Mm. So a good dose of mm. realism doesn't go astray. Absolutely. Mm. But is there any hope for us in the midst of this frustration? I think there is, because if, if we look at that passage, we'll notice that work itself is not cursed, um, the ground is actually cursed. And so it's the process of working that is cursed. Work is still good. It still retains that goodness that we talked about. So it, it still can be the source of meaning and purpose for us. It can still be something we actually really enjoy and, and we get a, a sense of dignity from. It can still be really good in all those aspects as well. Mm. Now you mentioned the ground being cursed. Mm. And so I guess our working of it is frustrated. Mm. Uh, but our, our logos for the day 
Mm. Uh, Romans chapter 8, it gives some hope Mm. for that, doesn't it? It it speaks into that idea of the ground being cursed. Romans chapter 8 is a passage in the Bible which, I guess, reflects on the future for this world. But before we reflect on, I guess, the future of things, Mm. does it also contribute or add anything to why work might be frustrating? Yeah, so I think what we see in this passage is we see it really takes us back to Genesis in lots of ways when we see that idea about creation is actually subjected to this frustration and oh, just this picture that is so for real for me of creation groaning <laughs> as in the pains of childbirth. I mean, we have days like that where we, we're groaning mm. for how much more we would hope from, from work, um, where we see that things are, are just, we're just struggling along at work and it's not what it should be. Um, so there's a real sense of, yeah, this draws a really excellent picture of what it's like. Um, so it's actually naming the fact that, that the whole world is actually crying out from relief from the struggle Mm. of sin, I guess, the struggle of this decay. So Mm. creation is groaning and we're Mm. working that creation and so we groan Mm. too. But give us some hope, Cara. Is there any (laughs) hope uh, in that passage there in Romans 8? There is because, I mean, the thing that's changed between Genesis and and Paul talking to the Romans here is actually that Jesus has come. (laughs) What difference does that make? Well, I think it makes a lot of difference. One of the things I love about Jesus is I love his work. (laughs) He actually works against a whole load of those things that we see that are part of the broken down nature. So, you know, he heals people of diseases and things that wouldn't have been part of the original that that are part of of when that decay started entering. Um, He sets people free from all sorts of bondage that they're feeling. um, And he he forgives people for some of the crap that they see happening inside of them. So we see that he's actually working against the forces that are actually bringing about this decay and this frustration and this pain. And I think that's really part of the source of this hope. So what we're actually seeing is that there's a bit of relief that we can experience now um, but there's a big picture too about that one day all of this stuff will be put right. You get that picture there at the end of that verse 20 that creation is frustrated now but there is hope, yep. hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage mm. to decay. Yeah and I love that picture of um, glory being revealed in us, just this idea that, that something beautiful can actually happen within us and eventually will have its full expression. It's beautiful. Mm. Do you get some hope from that first sentence there mm. as well, that I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the, the glory that will be revealed? Absolutely. So whenever we get too frustrated, <laughs> too annoyed, um, we have this little glimpse of, of the future, which will be a lot more pleasant, and an awareness, I guess, that in Christ we can actually begin to experience some of that now, some of that relief. Mm. So who is this hope for? Well, it does talk there about um, being the children of God. And I think, so primarily this is obviously written to people who are Christians and to people who've done what I did as a child myself of actually opening up the door of their heart. I think that's when this process of transformation, glory being revealed begins to start. Um, But there's a picture there of actually the whole of creation will experience this liberation eventually. Mm. So it's this idea of, I guess, Jesus opens up the way into Mm. this hope for all things being made new. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Now we spoke earlier about, I guess, some of the different ways that Mm. we might try and deal with um, frustration in our work. We've looked at parts of the Bible here. Does that provide any help uh, for how we might deal with frustration now not just in terms of giving us hope for the future yeah i think so because of this idea that this glory is actually being revealed so we actually can be agents of bringing about some relief from that frustration um there are i think there are three things that we can reach out for in all of this one is excellence we noticed that when God made the world. He said it was good. It was very good. And we can, we can make sure that our part, our work is actually excellent as much as we are able to. And we can aim for that in spite of the frustration. The second thing is truth. I think we see that that truth was a fundamental way that Jesus actually worked. And um, God seems to go on about truth quite a lot and integrity. So I think that's a very important thing that we need to take on to look for for something that is true and uphold that and have integrity in the way we work. Um, And the third thing is beauty. 
Um, I think we, we have a real opportunity to actually do things creatively. We're made in the image of a creative God. Let's, let's look for ways to creatively work against some of those things that frustrate, um, find solutions, create something better, try and make our workplaces places that are actually flourishing, not decaying. Have you got suggestions of how you might have tried to have done some of those things in, in your working life? Sure. Um, I think there's a few things. Uh, I've, I've talked quite a bit recently about creating hospitable places. Mm. That's a really simple thing where you, you actually have influence over your, your workplace, um, just your workspace and the people you come into contact with. If you can as much as possible make that a hospitable place where people feel welcome, comfortable, where they feel they can, they can talk about stuff openly and honestly, I think that's a really significant thing. Mm. Mm. It says there in that final uh, sentence there in that passage in Romans, We wait patiently. Mm. Does that idea of patience have practical implications for how we deal with frustration at work now? Yeah, it seems the opposite of waiting with frustration, doesn't it? (laughs) Um, There are actually two waits there. There's a a little bit earlier, there's, there's talking about waiting eagerly. We're actually waiting eagerly, looking... To, to Jesus, looking to God, looking to this future that is coming. But we're waiting patiently in the meantime. And I think because we have this hope of the future, it means that we know that the mess and the frustration that we see now is not the end of the story. Is there a sense in which there's an appropriate kind of grumbling or, or groaning that Romans 8 talks about as well? Yeah, I don't think we should be like Pollyanna, you know, put on a happy face and just smile and pretend it's not hard. Like, that's what I like about the Bible is it's actually realistic about Mm. these difficult things. Uh, And I I think it's fair to say, look, this is hard, but we understand why it's hard. Now, what can we do in light of that, in light of what we actually know also about the change that is happening and the the potential for the future? Mm. Sakara, I am frustrated at work. What's the solution? (laughs) Well, I think we take great comfort from the fact that other people are frustrated at work too, obviously, quite hugely. Um, We take comfort from the fact that there is actually a plan in place where things are going to be put right. And we begin to work with the one who actually knows what those frustrations are intimately, who knows us intimately, um, and who can actually show us how we can use our gifts and skills to actually turn around that situation and make it a flourishing thing. Mm. Let me leave you with the Logos of the day from Romans chapter 8, verses 20 to 21. The creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that it will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Look forward to you joining us next time for Logos Live. Please thank our guest today, Cara Martin.